Okay, if you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles to the, um, the book of Revelation and chapter 3. And I want to tell you just two stories before we start. Um, I'm playing catch up a little bit because of what happened last week. And so I'm giving last week's message this week because it's all part of a series. And so what I say next week will hopefully make sense after you hear what um, I say this week. But... Um, the first story is the perhaps one of the strangest communions I've ever had to lead in my life was when I was on a, a Royal Navy ship doing an exercise with the American Navy. And you had some Navy SEALs who uh, had just come back from an exercise and they had a couple of hours off and they were going back to do another exercise. And so it was all painted in all their camouflage gear. They had loaded up with weapons, bristling literally with sort of like weapons. And when they heard there was a chaplain on the ship, they said, can we have a communion? And so I was flown over by helicopter to the other ship, and I went and did a communion to some of these Navy SEALs who were Christians. And it's the first time I've ever done a communion with all these guys bristling with weapons and, um, and stuff like that. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I mention that because I was saying something about a conversation that I had with them um, during that time afterwards, before they went back on exercise. And I went back to the... Um, ship I was serving on. The second story you may have heard or read in the news just recently that apparently some schools, I don't know if it's been rolled out nationwide now, whether it's official policy or just some schools, but um, in sports days there's no winners or losers now. Everybody's a winner. If you take part, you're now a winner. Apparently that's supposed to be official policies. Isn't it interesting they don't apply the same principles to the Olympics? Nobody's going to get a medal. You're all going to go a medal because you're all winners and so forth. And we could say the same with premiership football and so forth. It would be absolutely ludicrous to say that. What's the point of competing if everybody's a, a winner? It's the same with the Christian life. If you think when the Apostle Paul says that we run the race to win the prize, he says we need to unhinder ourselves from everything that will stop us running the race as efficiently and as swiftly as we can so that we can do those things Christ calls us to do and be the people he calls us to be. Before I read this passage, I just want to give um, just some things that I've discovered during my Christian life and that some of you have also discovered as well, which is why I'm asking you to give testimonies. Um, you know, please do, if you want to give one next week, please do come and tell me and um, just come and share whatever's on your, your heart. It'll be wonderful to do that. But one of the things I've discovered, it's better to be known for what we stand for than what we stand against. I don't want people in this town and community to know, oh, the church is against this, against that. I'd rather them to be able to say, we know the church is for this, that we're for faith, for hope and charity, and not just a project in general, that we're a people of faith, that we want to proclaim Christ. We're a people of hope that we believe that the Christian message teaches us hope for this life as well as beyond it. And we're a people of charity, that we generally want to help those people in our community who need it. Isn't it be better to be known for that, to be known for the things we stand for, rather than the things we stand against? The second thing is that God is always speaking, but his people do not always listen. That's one of the things I've discovered in the Christian life, and it's important at this time for every church in the world at this time to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Another thing I've learned, and I'll be saying a bit more about these in a, in a short while, but a person or a church is what they do, not what they say they will do. In other words, we as people, we are what we do, not simply what we say we will do. And churches are so good at saying what they will do and never do it. We need to be a people who do what we say we will do. Another thing I've discovered is that you do not have to be perfect for God to use you. Thank goodness for that. I'd be the first to go and sit down in the front pew there and say, I can't do anything, Lord, if you want us to be perfect. You do not have to be perfect for God to use you. Nobody makes a bigger mistake than the person who does nothing because they thought they could only do a little. That's all God asks us to do. If all we can do is a little for him, that's enough. That's all we need to do. You don't have to be perfect for God to use you. We don't have to be perfect for God to use us. Another thing I've discovered is obey God and leave the consequences of your obedience to him. You can't serve God 
if you have fear of people as the dominant factor in your heart and mind. We've got to do what God tells us to do and leave the consequences of our obedience to him. You can never please everybody, but you don't have to. As long as you're doing what God calls you to do and to please in him, that's what truly counts in life. The final thing, not the final thing I've learned, it would be a shame if all I've learned is seven things in the Christian life, but the final thing I'm going to share with you this morning before we look at this passage is when you think things are going well, it's probably because you're not aware of all the facts. Just like last week when we thought the service was going well and we wasn't aware of what was happening out at the back. But I'm going to read this um, passage and you'll probably, some of the things I will say this morning with this passage and also the passage next week about turning the other cheek, it will surprise you because it doesn't mean what you think it means. Okay, turning the other cheek and those things are where Christ is teaching us how to maintain our dignity in an oppressive situation. And we'll talk about the different types of love because love is not an emotion. In our Western society, when Christ told us to love people, because we've only got one word for love, we relate it to emotions and think, oh, everybody we meet, we've got to be this gushing, soft, emotional person. That's not what it's talking about. Love is a frame of mind. It's actually a, a way of action. That's why we can meet a complete stranger who could be an absolutely despicable person who we may not like, but we can be loving towards them because of the values we have, the way we treat that person, despite what's going on inside of us. That's what we'll look at um, next week. But it's important to remember that love is not an emotion. And this week, the title of the message is, What Sort of Church Did Jesus Die For? And so I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, but I would wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have required, acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, as a theologian and a minister, I often smile and sometimes maybe even blush a little bit when I hear this passage spoken about by some people who totally misinterpret it. People will take it in the abstract. We need to be on fire for God. We need to pray more, do more, do more. And it's an abstract thing where it's telling us to, or the preacher may say, we need to be doing more of this to prove that we're on fire for God. That's actually not what the passage is saying at all, as I will actually explain in the short time that we have. But let me ask this question. What brought an end to some of the great societies that built some of the wonders of the world? Just think about that. Anchor what? The imposing Mayan temples or the majestic Easter Island. What brought an end to some of these incredible societies that built such fantastic monuments. They all invested vast resources of time, people and materials, yet each vanished, leaving behind them little more than haunting remains of lost greatness. The same question could be asked, what brought about an end to some of the great churches or dominant denominations that changed the course of history? When you think about it, when you look at some of the denominations that some are even vanishing now in our own day and age, and some that have already gone, what happened to some of the great churches or denominations that changed the course of history? 
They all invested vast resources of time, people and material, yet each vanished, or in some cases are still diminishing, leaving behind them little more than remains of lost greatness. And that's what this passage is actually talking about, because the same question could be asked of any individual church, so let's ask it. Now, this passage is not about individual Christians. Again, you may have some preachers or ministers will use it to try and bash individual Christians. You need to pray more, you need to. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is actually the corporate mind of the church. What's the dominant mind, the dominant attitude of a corporate congregation of people? Because in my experience, most individual Christians I know are doing their best to serve God within the limits of their knowledge and ability as best as they can. Most Christians are seeking to do everything they possibly can do. That's my experience in years of ministry, that most Christians are doing whatever they can do. And so what's the point of a minister trying to say, well, do more to be on fire for God, be more active, be more active? That's totally not what this passage is actually talking about. I've also seen that many a Christian, both minister and layperson, suffers from emotional or mental separating wounds inflicted by barbs of criticism. That's why I make sure I emphasise that, that this passage is not about, it's not criticising the individual Christian, it's talking about the corporate mind of the church. Because as Christians, we do not, nor should not, seek to live our Christian lives alone. We walk with Christ in fellowship with other people, but each one of us is different. Thank God we're not all the same. All of us, we have different backgrounds, different history, different story. As a minister, you get to hear my story. This morning we heard Steve's story. We hope to hear some of your stories over the next few weeks just to what Christ is doing in your um, lives. Yet we are called to pursue a shared mission of witnessing to the power of Christ and his ability to change people's lives for the better. So people with different emotions, different stories, different backgrounds are called to come together to witness for Christ and to join together to do his work. And that's what this passage is actually talking about. And Jesus was an emotional person. The Bible offers numerous times when he expressed his emotions. And the Gospels show that he felt sorrow, he felt grief, loneliness, frustration, anger, love, concern, compassion, and many more feelings along the human spectrum of emotion. And Christ knows what we feel because he has felt exactly the same emotions. So whatever we feel as humans, he's been through that. Emotions are good. Emotions are our friends. Emotions are a sign of strength, not weakness. And emotions are to be encouraged. But we would all agree there's a time and a place for them. They cannot be the ruling force of anybody's life. As unchecked emotions, as well as having positive value, can be incredibly destructive. So if anger is the dominating emotion in a person's life, you see the destruction it wreaks. If fear is the dominating factor in a person's life, you see the many missed opportunities they let go by because they are too afraid to do whatever it is they need to do. And I'm sure we've all witnessed times when somebody who has let out all of their emotions at the wrong time, in the wrong place, to the detriment of themselves or another person. I remember doing a job interview for a, a staff manager at one of the offices at uh, an air station. And the person came in and they failed the interview in the first 20 seconds, even though we had to go through the emotions. When they started saying, oh, my life is terrible, was there a good statement? <laughs> One person, you know what I mean? But they just poured out emotions and said, oh, sorry, I've just had a rough week, I suppose I'd better let you do the interview. Yes, good morning, how are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? So you can see how there's a time and a place for everything, of course. Fear is a good emotion at the right time, in the right place, it might just save our lives. Okay, so emotions are good and positive, but obviously there's a, a balance. And emotional self-control is a good discipline to have. And this is what this passage is talking about. Because in the book of Revelation, it's Christ who sent a revelation to John to give to the angel guarding each church. And he was talking about the corporate mind of the church or the collective consciousness of the people that come together to form the congregation of Christ. Here's some interesting facts. Did you know in every group of 100 people, on average, 
10 will be hostile to every form of authority. It's the same if you had a group of 10 people. On average, one person will be hostile to any form of authority figure. Five will become, out of 100, will become highly emotional and unstable in times of pressure. Four people out of every 100, when aroused to hate, would agree to violence as a means of solving the issue. And it's these sort of people, when you see these peaceful protests that suddenly go wrong, it's very easy to disrupt a protest if you understand communal psychology and the power of the corporate mind. All you have to do is find those people who you know are going to react like that, stir them up, and the small minority of people could suddenly overcome the corporate mind of the protest, and it suddenly turns violent and starts to spread and turns into chaos when it was meant to be peaceful, and so forth. One in 12 people are susceptible to creating a memory out of thin air and then believe in it. You 11 people, you're wrong. I remember it very, very clearly. The 11 people know that's not how it happened. This is how it happened. One in 12 people are susceptible to creating a memory out of thin air and believe in it. One in 12 people are highly susceptible to the power of suggestion. And it's this, these people stage hypnotists look for during their shows. If you know the signs, you can see the suggestive people by the body language and the way they react to certain things that are said. And that's why the hypnotist, you'll look, if you've ever seen these shows, he'll line the people up, he'll tell you, sit down, you go up there, you sit down. You see, it's all understanding how people react in any given situation. One in 12 people relate to everything they experience or hear to their own self-perception and therefore cannot consider or take in any other point of view, no matter how logically or rationally it may be presented. So the church is made up from people, and all of us who've been in church for a while know it's similar in church situations. There's different viewpoints and different opinions and so forth. The problem that Christ was addressing to the church of Laodicea was this. It was simply that the church was drifting along and had lost its purpose. That was the corporate problem, I'm sure, within that congregation. There may have been people who were seeking to run the race as fast as they can. There may have been the whole spectrum of the human experience. But the corporate mind of the church, for whatever reason, they were just drifting along, happy just to plod along, and they'd actually lost their purpose. That's what the imagery, when Christ said, I'm ready to spit you out of my mouth, because the church is the mouthpiece of God. So he was saying, I can't use you to be my mouthpiece. It's no good. You've lost your purpose. You've lost your value. And as a result, the church of Laodicea was already starting to diminish, to vanish. Yet look how self-deceived it was. Laodicea was famous for its financiers and banking. The people were spiritually poor, but they deluded themselves that they were spiritually rich. It was famous for its textile manufacturing, making clothes. They thought they were clothed with Christ, but were naked. He said, buy white garments from me to be clothed. And it was famous for its physicians, particularly its eye ointments, but they were blind and they could not see. And he said, buy the ointment from me to see. Now this is what the hot and cold thing means. This is why, as a theologian, I smile if a preacher says, be on fire for God. I share this with the deacons because this passage is saying, be cold for God. Let me explain what that means. It's actually a referral to Old Testament Jewish wisdom literature when cold was positive. It's positive. It's like saying, well, be cool-minded. Have a cool mind about this. Okay, this is what Christ is saying. When he's saying, I'd rather you were cold or hot, he's saying, be level-headed. Be cool-minded. Hot was negative. It was a bad metaphor. If you look at Proverbs 8, 15, 18, which says, a hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a cool-headed man calms a quarrel, and the way of the sluggard is blocked with thorns. And what Christ was saying is saying, you're neither one or the other. He was saying, you're not level-headed, you're not thinking rationally, you're not thinking logically, you're not saying, this is our purpose as a people, we're going to be level-headed and disciplined to make sure we do those things God calls us to do. He even said, I would rather you be the other way, I'd rather you were highly emotional as long as you were doing something. Even if you were not being driven by level-headedness, be driven by emotion. But it was the fact they were just indifferent, willing to plod along and do nothing. That's what this passage is talking about. It's talking about that corporate mind 
that has to be challenged rather than just allowing us to plod along and forget the purpose of why we are here. That's what it means to be lukewarm according to this. It just means to be indifferent. That's fine. That's fine. We'll just carry on as we are. And Christ was saying you need to be cool-headed. You need to find out what your purpose is and then you need to seek to do it because indifference leads to di- in decision and also the lukewarm metaphor also refers to the hard water that um, used to come from the springs carried along the aqueducts to the roman baths and by the time it got to the baths it was hot when it came out by the time it got to the baths it was lukewarm and so the romans would either heat it or they would cool it in their baths they would actually heat it up so you could go into like the hot spring or they would cool it down so you could go into the cool bath so it's also the lukewarm was that it was not fit for purpose by the time it came there so they had to change it that's what christ is saying to this church here and i'm so grateful that we as a church we're not plodding along we're not indifferent we've been very pragmatic made the decision last year to accept the faith hope and charity project as the way forward and we're going to see great things happen but let me close by saying this about the navy seals i told you that story when i was sitting there with them we were just chatting and um you know they give good bottles of wine and champagne by the way if you do a communion for them they went to their mess bar and they said i'll take this back to the uh, wardroom all these bottles of champagne so getting back on a helicopter with a case of champagne after a communion was quite a was quite an experience and the guys on my ship were very happy when i gave that to the wardroom but they were speaking and they were telling me about their motto and so they gave me a copy of their motto and i've changed it a bit that i think it's a good motto for kind of churches to have so this is based what i say now in closing is based on the navy seals motto my loyalty to my god and church is beyond reproach i humbly serve as a guardian to my fellow christians always ready to support and defend the gospel and God's people. I will serve with honour with my calling on and off the battlefield. The ability to control my emotions and my actions, regardless of circumstances, sets me apart from other people. Uncompromising integrity is my standard. My character and honour will be steadfast. My word will be my bond. I lead by example in all situations. I will never quit. I will preserve and thrive on adversity. If knocked down, I will get back up every single time. I will draw on every remaining ounce of my strength to accomplish my mission. I am never out of the fight. I practice discipline. I live by innovation. The success of my mission depends upon me as well as my God. My technical skill, my tactical proficiency and attention to detail, my training and knowledge is never complete. I stand ready to rely upon the full spectrum of God's power and promises in order to achieve my mission and the goals established by my God. The execution of my duties will be guided by the very principles that I seek to proclaim. Brave men and women have fought and died building the church and keeping the gospel alive so that I could hear it and that now I am trusted to proclaim to my generation. The legacy of those who have gone before and who serve with me now steadies my resolve and silently guides my every deed. I will not fail to do that which God calls me to do. Obviously that's adapted. It's very different how they say it. It's to do with nation and so forth. But we'll close with this. Just remember what Christ is speaking to the churches there. He's not speaking to individual Christians. He's saying let that be the corporate attitude of your church that you'll hear what the Spirit says to the churches, that you'll be level-headed, you'll be wise to do that which he calls you to do, you won't be indifferent. I'd rather you are highly emotional rather than just indifferent. So he that hears what the Spirit is saying to the churches, hear. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the great love you have for us. And as I shared at the beginning of this message, I thank you for the witness and service of so many Christians. I know so many people, Lord, do what they can do within the realms of their time, their ability, their giftings and so forth. 
That's the reason we're part of the church, Lord. It's the reason we seek to follow you. We do what we can. But sometimes, Lord, the collective mind can be so powerful that it can inhibit the church from doing and being what you call them to be. So help us learn these lessons, Lord. Open our eyes that we may truly see. Open our ears that we may truly hear. That we will be wise, level-headed, pragmatic, decisive in our mission and what we are about as your people. And save us from indifference. In Christ's name. Amen.